Hey everyone, it's Max. I'm excited for our conversation today and to bring our phone a friend segment from the podcast over to YouTube. And our guest today does not disappoint. Born in the UK, reared in Florida, and currently residing in the Big Easy, our phone a friend guest today is, let's just say, a little difficult to put in a box. Now for my money, and I'm not sure how he'll feel about this characterization, he's this generation's answer to Gore Vidal. A prolific writer, comfortable raconteur, keen polemicist, and seemingly capable of speaking on any topic under the sun, he's a throwback to another time. Nathan J. Robinson is the author of 10 nonfiction books and four illustrated books. He defied modernity by launching a magazine, yes, an actual physical magazine called Current Affairs, which blends eye-popping and fun illustrations with scathing prose and real, authentic journalism. Nathan and I have a wide-ranging conversation from education to socialism in our inaugural video and audio phone-a-friend, and I can't wait to bring you in. So enjoy. Nathan, welcome into the show. It's so great to have you here. Thank you for appearing on UNFTR. Hey, nice to be with you, Max. So I imagine you've heard this before, but I was personally introduced to your work by way of Jordan Peterson, of all places. In fact... It was because I was searching for an answer to what exactly people saw in mm. Jordan Peterson mm. when I came across a clip of none other than Noam Chomsky responding to that very question. Yeah. And his response was essentially, my thoughts are perfectly encapsulated by Nathan J. Robinson's article on Peterson. So at the risk of embarrassing you by quoting your own article, I just kind of wanted to start off with, with this little nugget. Here's a snapshot yeah. for the UNFTR audience of that article. Jordan Peterson appears very profound and has convinced many people to take him seriously, yet he has almost nothing of value to say. This should be obvious to anyone who has spent even a few moments critically examining his writings and speeches, which are comically befuddled, pompous, and ignorant. They're half nonsense, half banality. In a, re in a reasonable world, Peterson would be seen as the kind of tedious crackpot that one hopes not to get seated next to on a train. So... I love this for so many reasons, not the least of which is uh, I, I no longer felt alone in the world that somebody had actually put into words what, yeah. was, what <laughs> was actually unfolding before my eyes. But so let me ask you, what was the impact of that article on your career and sort of how yeah. do you interpret in this modern day the, just the, the evolution of all the false prophets that seem to proliferate mm. in our space? Mm. Yeah, I, I hadn't heard that in a while because I wrote that back in 2018. I feel like we've all been next to that guy on that train. Um, it was, uh, you know, that, that piece, uh, I, I was pleased with the success of that piece mostly because it, it antagonized Jordan Peterson, who <laughs> has commented on it several times, um, but never tried to rebut anything I say. And I go through his writings in great, great detail. Um, and he agreed uh, to do a debate with me. He said he wanted to explain his ideas to me, but when I tried to actually set it up, he has been ducking me for a, a couple of years, um, uh, despite people people poking him. Um, but you know, I, I, I that at the time that piece was written, he was getting a lot of pretty favorable coverage in the mainstream press. Um, you know, he'd had this controversy because uh, he refused to use people's preferred pronouns and said that if uh, said that Canada was trying to make it so that if he d didn't use the pronouns, he'd be hauled off to jail or whatever. Um, but in addition to the kind of controversy over wokeness that he had been part of, he had built up a huge following among young 
men, especially, I think almost all men, um, as this kind of father figure, and I'm sure he still has some of that, um, but he just published this book, Twelve Rules for Life, that's kind of a self-help book pitched at, at these lost, lost boys. Um, and one Vague of, generalizations if, that could basically be espoused by nearly everybody that were somewhat interconnected, some not interconnected, but really resonated with the public. Yes. Well, some of them were vague and meaningless. Some of them, unfortunately, were somewhat precise. Um, and uh, so when he was when he was vague, it was all fine. But when he would get very specific about the things that he would he believed, um, they they were often a little little terrifying. You know, he would say, you know, to young men, you you have to be a monster. Like, you've got to contain it, right. but you need to be capable of extreme violence and, like, to understand. I mean, he would say things that I feel like are just ver not very good life advice for someone who wants to live well among people. Um, also, but... the disconnect, I think, in hearing somebody uh, with his affect say, you have to be a monster. And, you know, in his you know, sort of very quiet Canadian way, it was, he, was, I don't know. Was yes. I mean, people have pointed out he has, uh, I believe, a vaguely Muppet-like uh, intonation <laughs> to his voice, which makes the threats of violence. So he's always been, to me, a very comical figure, right? I mean, he dresses ridiculously i mean I, I you know obviously glass houses throwing stones but he dresses <laughs> you know he wears these ridiculous and I wore a jacket. jacket for you today <laughs> i know and i didn't even wear a jacket um but um but no he developed this, this so that this this reputation among his audience and when you read the comments on his youtube videos and i do read youtube comments even though it's a cesspool because you learn a lot about how people are kind of thinking and um mm -hmm. they would just view him as a genius I mean, they would say, like, Dr. Peterson was sent to Earth with these profound insights to guide us out of the darkness and chaos into the light over and over and over, thousands and thousands of people. And, you know, I that was really what concerned me is, you know, I've critiqued culture war conservatives before, but Peterson was something kind of different because he was a guru. I mean, he was really mm. building a reputation as this man of transcendent genius. But So I, I wanted to look more into his work, and I got his big magnum opus, Maps of Meaning, and he's actually very good at creating the image of being a genius through saying things that are incredibly complicated so that you think they must be just too sophisticated for you to possibly understand. Um, and one of the things that I want to do with current affairs is to teach people not just leftist values, but critical thinking, you know, how to see through BS, because I know that it's very easy to fool people with a few tricks. I mean, and so I want to use what I kind of know about arguments and critical thinking to, to expose those, those types of people. So that was what I was trying to do uh, with that. Not just teach people about Peterson, but teach people to see how to see through people like that. Right. Well, so let's, let's dig into critical thinking through the lens of higher education because uh, you're actually a product of uh, a virtually unparalleled uh, experience in the higher education system. So we count yeah. Brandeis, Harvard, Yale, um, you know, in, in your history. And, you know, as someone who understands the value of higher education, but probably bore witness to uh, maybe the bureaucracy of academia and maybe some of the double standards in academia, particularly through your PhD process, um, I'm wondering how you're interpreting the Supreme Court decision recently, uh, the ruling on affirmative action, you know, having been so close to uh, the elite schools in this country, how do you see this playing out? And how did you how did you interpret that? And, and how did current affairs stand sure. on affirmative action? You know, I, I haven't actually written about the affirmative action decision in some ways, because you know, I have mixed feelings and not mixed feelings about affirmative action, because I think it's, you know, I, I'm fully in support of it, but also because I know, having passed through these institutions, that they exist essentially to create the ruling class. And so in some ways, the debate about affirmative action is a debate about how are we going to pick 
the members of the ruling class. Um, and to me, mm. that is a, a bit of a frustrating conversation because obviously there are more and less fair ways that you could pick the members of the ruling class. And if we have a debate that says, well, okay, should elite colleges account for the fact that for hundreds and hundreds of years uh, in this country, there has been uh, a great deal of racism that has caused people disproportionately not to have the same... Um, it's often, it's it's really, I think, at root, uh, social capital. That the, 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 the people don't have the same level of ability to form the kinds of connections that get you to the people who can tell you how to get into these universities. Sure, so we're going to sure. try and make up for that somehow, that massive difference in the social capital that tends to be present in uh, different in, in, across different demographic groups um, with by adjusting the admissions numbers. Okay. I think that's fair. I think that's reasonable. Um, I can I can give you examples of uh, you know people that I know who are brilliant but who benefited from affirmative action, and it's a good thing that they did because you know it allowed them to flourish in ways that they wouldn't necessarily have uh, with a supposedly merit uh, neutral merit based system. But again, at root, we're discussing, you know, how does Harvard admit people? And if you're someone who, like me, has come away from that thinking that Harvard as an institution shouldn't really exist, that it should be, uh, you know, just the the, Cam the University of Massachusetts Cambridge, a public uh, a public university in Cambridge, Massachusetts, that has an open admissions policy. I mean, I wrote an article. Um, in response to a debate about whether the SAT or admissions essays were the fairer way to admit people. And some people say the SAT is fairer, some people say the SAT is very unfair. And my article was called Admit Everybody. And because the value that I hold is that everyone should be able to go to and have the best possible education that we can provide. It's not that difficult. I've seen the education that is provided at Harvard University. It is not that much better than is provided at public universities. So I, this whole like letting in 4% of the applicants because we have these special schools where you get a brand and then when you're branded that way, you get, you get, you know, all the doors open to you forever. I just reject that so, system so totally that to write about affirmative action is a little difficult for me. Fair enough. Yeah. And, and it's interesting when in the pieces that we've done on UNFTR, looking back through history, it's I've, I was sort of amazed by how universally accepted and proposed the public education system was from the from the early childhood all the way through uh, public universities in nearly all of the literature that you can find among from the founding fathers through most of U.S. history. This recent attack on education, on higher education, on the, the rules of admittance into different forms of education and specialization seems to be a more recent phenomenon to me, sort of the last gasps of the neoliberal era where they were trying to really attack and undermine the underpinnings of the value proposition of the United States. But for so much, for when we talk about the conservative wing of the party, for so much of our history, the the conservative wing of the party was actually the one that was most in favor of widespread education because a you know an educated population made for a controllable population, mm -hmm. and so it's I don't know what it pretends about where we are in the political system today that so many of these institutions that were generated with we call it bipartisan support, but you, just generally universal democratic principles are now under attack so specifically from one particular end of the party. Well, I, in some ways, I would say that there has been a great deal of success in reforming higher education in some ways so that an education, an educated population is not necessarily a controllable uh, an educated population, not necessarily a controllable population. In fact, you know, and I think this is one of the good legacies of the 1960s, is that conservatives aren't necessarily wrong that when young people go to college, they learn things that can be subversive 
and mm. that had caused them to come out challenging some of the presuppositions that they went in with. Um, because I do think they, this was certainly the case for me at Brandeis. I went in and I took a class uh, called uh, Marxism versus Anarchism. And uh, it was all about the, this was what the, like, the most formative class of my undergraduate years because it just, I, I had no idea first that there was really a radical, organized radical left. And I didn't know about the kind of debates between the libertarian socialists and the authoritarian social or state socialists. And I didn't know about all of the strands of left intellectual history. It's so eye opening for me. Um, and it, and I caused me to want to read more. And then I became a, um, I became an African American studies major. And that opened my mm. eyes too, because I mean, I knew that there was racial inequality, but I didn't know about the entire history of black intellectual thought, right? So I didn't know about the debates between uh, Du Bois and Booker T. Washington or, you know, and Marcus Garvey. And I, I, you know, I found out all of this stuff that I that I didn't know and hadn't been taught. And it was like the, the layers were being peeled back and I was seeing parts of the country that I hadn't seen and started to look at it in a, in a new way. And so in some ways that attack on education makes a bit of sense. I don't think that the right is totally irrational. I mean, they see young people coming out of, co of colleges with, you know, the dangerous new ideas that they picked up in a class that they took. So you touched on something that's that's going to resonate with the UNFTR audience in this particular moment because we're in the process of going through uh, kind of the history of 19th century socialism and the transition point from uh, the European socialist experiment and how that was interpreted in the United States through the uh, sort of the bifurcated socialist and labor movement in the United States and then how everything splintered and fractured from that point forward. So it's a really interesting time to speak to somebody who is actually so so schooled in that I love the fact that your, your, the door that kind of opened for you, or I guess the window into this exploration was in studying the um, sort of the chasm between the anarchists and the state socialists that, uh, that, that had emerged in the 19th century. Um, as we look at today – and and we can f kind of look in hindsight and deconstruct all these uh, amorphous definitions of of anarchism that then produced uh, whether it was syndicalism or um, libertarian socialism and all the different tributaries that stemmed from that original thought. We're in a very peculiar time where socialism has been allowed to be resurrected in conversation in the United States. It still remains vilified in the obvious places, including. Um, <clears throat> including the Democratic Party as an example. But it is, it's now palatable to bring it up in conversation. We can explore some of these themes. But I think the mystery surrounding socialism is still as confounding to people as it was when, you know, uh, when you had Bakunin fighting with Marx in the 19th yeah. century. Yeah. So as you interpret it today, what, now that we can now that we understand that we live in a broad based market system that is the foundation of the international and global economy period end of story hard stop there will be no revolution of small individual feudal style communes that all of a sudden come to some grand collective that overthrow the never market say never, system Max. of the world economy <laughs> I'm going to say never in this case because <laughs> it's a thousand degrees in new orleans and we're both running out of time here <laughs> Okay, yeah, so we'll probably in, perish first. <laughs> so in, in that spirit, as you evaluate with your knowledge of this, and I mean, you wrote a book on socialism, just I think it, it came out in, in 2019, right? Yeah, why you should be a socialist. <laughs> why you should be a socialist. So when you have this conversation with people, how do you open the door to introducing this conversation in, in an objective way that kind of resonates with people that allows you to explore this kind of line of thinking? And what do you find resonates about messaging that, that we can build upon today? Yeah, well, I mean, I learned a lot from watching how Bernie Sanders communicates, which is to not lead with theory, to lead with issues, and mostly to lead with the issues that affect people's lives the most. And, and so if you're talking about how do you have conversations with people, you have conversations with people by pointing out 
various problems that you think they will also recognize and you will talk about you know i mean you could talk about corporate profiteering and you can talk about the effect it has especially in you know obviously the, the most obvious example in the united states is uh, is healthcare um and mm -hmm. everyone's got a terrible healthcare experience and you can very easily then show I mean, you can you can show the core of the socialist critique very easily, which is that the private ownership of you want to say the means of production, but pretty much the private ownership of anything for profit, right, creates these bad anti-social incentives because it creates incentives to enrich the owners um, at the expense of everyone else. And sometimes the interests of the owners coincide with the interests of the consumers. Um, and so in the way that the famous phrase of Adam Smith about, you know, the, the butcher and the baker don't give me my meat and my bread because they like me, but because it's in their interest to do so. And I get, you know, I get my meat and they get their money. Um, and, and so sometimes the self-interest kind of harmonizes in the, in the way that the, those who believe that the invisible hand of the free market guarantees justice for all, um, think it does. But sometimes it really doesn't, and often it really doesn't, and often there is a clash of classes, right, as we see uh, right now in Hollywood, or as we see at UPS, where the people who are doing the work uh, don't have the same interests as the people who own the companies. Uh, at UPS, for example, the companies didn't want to put air conditioning in the trucks. Now, the workers really wanted air conditioning in the trucks because it's incredibly hot outside and they're going to uh, fall down and die if they don't get... But from the company's perspective, they're replaceable and air conditioning is expensive. So you, you can see the class struggle in miniature right there. So as I say, you start with an issue, a case study, a, an event... And you show how, you know, the workings of class, the workings of how the structure of who owns what is determining what happens. And, you know, then you make the socialist critique, which is, well, if the drivers owned the company, they would have air conditioning today. And whose side are you on? Are you on the side of the people who want to make money off of the drivers delivering the packages? Or are you on the side of the people who deliver the packages and would like to do so under moderately humane conditions? Okay, so you you mentioned something uh, in the beginning of your response there about the way that Bernie Sanders was able to introduce mm. concepts that resonated with the American public. I think part and parcel of that, though, which is something that <clears throat> we need to deal with on the left and uh, has has actually caused you know great cleavage in the discussion on the left, is how we introduce these topics and themes, and through through the auspices of which party we introduce them. So if we're to think about Cornell West coming into the fold yeah. on the Green Party line, much in the way that Jill Stein did, you have, of course, the left, the, I, I say the left, the, the, the moderate middle left, uh, the liberal wing of the party, criticizing him in the spoiler role, much as they did, much as you could do with Ross Perot or you could do with any third party candidate that has some level of intrigue coming into it. And then, of course, you have a very libertarian and conservative minded RFK Jr. coming in on the Democratic Party line, mm. perhaps playing even more of a, a psychological spoiler in the mix and not and doing the bidding of we're not really sure whom at this point. Mm -hmm. But as as we think about the success of Bernie, one of the one of the things that we've contended uh, on the show is that because we are facing the existential threat and crisis of climate change, as you and I at this very moment in time are living through what historians have determined to be the hottest month in the history of recorded history. Yeah, right. Ever. So facing this existential crisis, I feel a sense of urgency. Maybe it's my age. Maybe it's the fact that I don't have many productive decades left in my life to affect change. Maybe it's me seeing it through the lens of my children and what they're going to inherit. But with, with a limited capacity for change, my feeling is that it is more productive and important to infect the body politic and take over the apparatus of something that is already mature, that already exists on the ground level and already has uh, gr a ground game and a get out the vote strategy in every precinct, in every county, in every state of this nation. Whereas true leftists 
of which I consider myself one, mm-hmm. are certainly more in favor and for the lining with a I will not I will not align myself with the with the two with this duopoly the corporate duopoly of Democratic yeah. and Republican Party. I would prefer to throw my weight and my vote and my efforts behind the third party candidate. I. So it's the spoiler argument. It's it's all of these things wrapped into one. But my main thesis here is that I'm sorry we're out of time to build an infra- a th- true third party infrastructure is so takes so much time, organization and money and countervailing measures against the, the already established systems that exist down at the precinct level, yeah. which, by the way, <clears throat> somebody like Steve Bannon understands it's and it's and it is the secret to yeah. their power base in in that in that side of the spectrum. What are to borrow a phrase, what is to be done in the leftist movement yeah. to really try to corral the right support with the you know, understanding this sense of urgency? Yeah. Where do you land on that? Because you've been a Bernie supporter. Sure. But you yeah. also have been very public with the fact that you then fell in line, as we'll say, as I did, uh, and wound up holding your nose to vote for the establishment Democratic candidate. Oh, I didn't have to vote for Joe Biden because I live in Louisiana. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> so, but, uh, and I'm going to vote for Cornell West in this, uh, in this election. Because, I mean, I take, so I take a very pragmatic approach, right, where I try to think, okay, well, look, we live in the world, and what we're trying to do is actually alter the things around us. We're not trying to just express, you know, the desires of our heart. We are trying to think about the consequences of our actions. How do we get from where we are to where we need to be under immensely challenging conditions? Uh, and also knowing that, <laughs> really, we don't see a path to victory, right? Because whether Cornell West runs in the Democratic primary or Cornell West runs in the general election, between you and me, I don't think the next president is going to be Cornell West, <laughs> right? So we can have the debate over which is the correct strategy, but the answer is we're, we're probably going to lose either way on that. Um, so what can you what can you do? How can we actually actually build power? I mean, I think the spoiler effect is real, which is why you know I would probably vote for Joe Biden in a in a swing state. If, I mean, I would almost definitely vote for it because I think that with the climate emergency. The fact that the Republican Party, essentially their policy among every Republican is plunge us headlong into the abyss, right? Make it a, just, just burn as many fossil fuels as possible. Doesn't matter. Do whatever you like. Maximize corporate profits. Gut all environmental regulations. And, and at this moment, I mean, that's just collective suicide. So, um, the Repub- a Republican presidency is a vote for collective suicide. I don't, I believe in collective suicide, so I want to do whatever I can to, because I care about a lot of people in the world and I want to have a long life and I don't want to die in the heat. Um, so as inadequate and frustrating as it is, uh, to have a Biden presidency where he doesn't treat it as an emergency, he, uh, is happy to ap- approve more oil drilling for some, some reason. Um, it's better than a, you know, collective suicide. Um, so, uh, in terms of thinking about third parties and whatever, again, you take a pragmatic approach. Uh, there are elections where we can get third party candidates in. Those elections generally are not presidential elections. So, you know, Bernie Sanders first got into Congress as a third party candidate. Uh, he beat the Democrat right. and the Republican. Um, right. Uh, Shama Sawant in Seattle uh, shunned the Democratic Party, got into got onto the city council as an independent and was very, very effective, actually, as an independent independent of the party. So you find the races where that's possible and where it's possible to be independent of the party. You build your alternate infrastructure. Um, Cornell West, interesting case, he could run in the Democratic primary, which is rigged against him because they've already said there aren't going to be any debates or whatever, or he could run third party. There is a way to run third party that I think is a good idea, which is he runs third party and he says, I have three or four demands. These are my demands to Joe Biden. And I will drop out and endorse Joe Biden if Joe Biden does X, Y, and Z, and the and if you don't, if you if you don't do these things, I'm staying in the race. And if I spoil the race, that's your fault because you didn't you didn't adhere to my demands. Um, Fair. Uh, you, yeah. You're the spoiler. You spoiled it because you could have you could have issued these three executive orders that are Cornell West demand. So if that's what he does, I feel like that is thinking in terms of power uh, pragmatically. 
if he's so just running and he's like, I'm, t- "There's no way I'm dropping out. I'm ru- I'm running to give people a real choice." I think, well, then you know, that's not thinking about consequences. So let me turn that to you, actually, because we had uh, colleagues of ours recently interviewed Dr. West, and uh, we got, were able to squeeze a question in there, and it was essentially just that: is like, if knowing that this is, um, you know, this is. I don't want to call it a fool's errand, but it is the impossible stretch to think that he's going to become president on a third party line. What is the, what is the most important measure of reform that you would like to surface that you that you could see as a tangible result of your third party status uh, in at least in whether it's raising it in the public consciousness or in actualizing that through some sort of future public policy? And he really did not answer that question. So let me turn that to you. Uh, which tells me he's already a great politician, by the way. But let me turn that to you and ask you those three or four measures that you would love yeah. to see enacted, uh, you know, in a in a trade off. What what would that look like in your world? I mean, I, as we've said, I think that the number one emergency right now is the climate catastrophe all around us so you know number three number one two three and four could be uh i will stop all fossil fuel drilling projects i will announce a national climate emergency uh, we will you know a, i will endorse and push green new deal legislation in congress to get us to hit the targets and we will uh make these concessions to the developing world so that we can get an enforceable global climate agreement because the united states has historically never uh been willing to agree to enforceable uh targets because we don't you know we we don't want anyone enforcing anything against us we don't want international law so um if the united states is willing to make more concessions uh and really understand the position of china and india that it's quite unfair that uh we were willing to wreck the planet now we demand that they don't um (laughs) so you i I mean i i think that would be great right if he could say look i'm running third party unless you deal with the climate emergency that'd be it that'd be a i think a fantastic thing to do because uh, they're scared of Cornell West, and he can use that. <laughs> okay, so let, let me shift gears because uh, y- you you broadened our horizon, started talking about the rest of the world for a minute. There's there's mm. one thing that you have been uh, very unafraid of of tackling, and that is um, Israel. And mm. so, <laughs> you know, we know that criticizing yeah. Israel is the third rail in liberal and, and conservative circles. But it, now it's almost become a requirement um, on the far left, if you want to call it the far left, I, there's, you know, a, a requirement among leftists to be critical of the state of Israel and to and to basically call it out as the as an apartheid state. And you've been open about your your criticism of Israel, and you've even found yourself in hot water. I know that from, uh, from the past <laughs> your ex, your experience at the Guardian for even provoking the mildest of sentiments that was very tongue in cheek, by the way. And we you know we could unpack that another time, but um, you know from a journalistic perspective, and this is what I find really fascinating about you know your endeavor in current affairs, and we could talk more about journalism. Um, how do you? navigate sort of the entrenched views on either side in order to formulate objective pieces on the state of Israel and our relationship to it as you know because I'm not sure if people really understand this but you are the primary contributor you you are truly one of the most prolific people that I've ever encountered and 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 I'm I'm so happy that I actually have you in my life now so I could just I could look at this in awe but also, um, you're the editor in chief, and so yeah. when you're talking to you know your contributors, you're fielding maybe some critiques from uh, readers. How do you maintain that sense of objective balance when you are approaching anything uh, to do with the state of Israel? Well, objectivity is a, a strange word that doesn't really enter into my thinking very much. My my, I think about facts. And I think about values. So I begin with a commitment to never say things that are untrue and then and to always check that everything you're saying is true. And, you know, we it's very hard. Fact checking is very, very hard at a small magazine, um, you know, because it's it's tough. It's tough to get your facts straight. Mm -hmm. Um, A commitment to being willing to say things even when they go against 
you know, what someone with uh, what is often called your priors uh, would 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 want to or expect it to be true, right? So to acknowledge inconvenient facts and but combine that with a sense of your value. So I'm pretty open about the fact that I am a humanist, I'm a democratic socialist, I am someone who believes in taking the side of those who are oppressed against those who are oppressing them and you know who believes that everyone should have their basic needs met. And so there is no objectivity to the order of my priorities other that it, that can be separated from the values that I have right so we write about things we write about things in the world that violate my sense of of justice and things in this country that violate my sense of justice but that's my sense of justice right so it's not objective our choices of what to cover however when I when there are things that violate my sense of justice and I see them and I write about them try to do so in a way that does not I don't I don't think it is ever justified to distort what someone else is saying to make them seem different or worse than they actually are. So if I was writing about if I'm writing about Israel, for instance, um, I will quote the arguments of those who defend Israel, and I will quote those arguments fairly. And I will say what the I will I, I I've done analyses of pro-Israel op-eds where I don't tell you what they said I show you what they said by quoting them at great great length so that that my reader can trust that I am not distorting and caricaturing what they are saying and so I think right. if you if you begin with that kind of a commitment to being willing to represent the people who disagree with you fairly. You don't really need objectivity because you have, you know, your values, your fairness and your and your commitment to, to factual integrity and a willingness to correct things you get wrong. This recent ruling in, in the Knesset to basically uh, supersede uh, any judicial authority has obviously, uh, I, I want to say, woken up all sides of the... Of, it, it seems to be the youth movement in Israel that is that is kind of breaking against that. It's, I, I think, for for leftists, it's a a little bitter because they seem to have awakened to this the the, uh, the theory of justice while yeah. still remaining you know turning turning a blind eye to what's happening just several miles uh, you know from from the heart of of Israel uh, with the pal- the plight of the Palestinian people, particularly in, in uh, Gaza and the West Bank. So. Um, in some sense, it's like we're watching this unfold and saying, is that the tipping point where some sort of, uh, you know, at least turn to rationality will come back into Israeli politics? Is this is this has the Likud party and then their alignment with the really radical conservative far right in Israel gone too far with this with these recent moves? And uh, did Netanyahu kind of, you know, outthink himself here? Do you see this as a potential inflection point or is does is the irony just just too thick and that you know they they can't see themselves clearly internally because they can't you know look in the mirror? I don't know enough about about uh, internal Israeli politics to have an informed opinion on this because you know <laughs> I this this issue yeah as you as you suggest you know to me it seems more minor than it does to a lot of people uh, in, the, in the streets in, in Israel, because I think, you know, they talk about the erosion of Israeli democracy, and I feel like, <laughs> <laughs> erosion of what? <laughs> you notice right. the occupation? Um, you know, I, 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 the, the, I'm not sure Israel is going to be cured of its anti-democratic tendencies until the people of Israel recognize how anti-democratic the occupation is at its core and that they have a choice which is either give the palestinians a state which is becoming pretty much impossible because of how the the level of the settlements to the point where you know yeah. to draw uh it's, it's harder to draw a palestinian state than the you know a congressional district in alabama or whatever <laughs> like you know it's like it's like uh it's impossible uh or so the alternative is equal rights for everyone in 
uh, both Israel and the occupied territories, which, of course, they don't want to do because that destroys the uh, possibility of having an ethnic nationalist state. Um, in Israel. Not only that, but too many Palestinians now. It's too, many, it's too many Palestinians. So I mean, that's always been Jordan's view that, uh, you know, because Jordan had uh, the ability to absorb most of what we refer to as the Palestinian state. But uh, they were too concerned about losing uh, their sort of ethnic control over governance as well. So, so sort of still find ourselves in the middle. So Israel has had a choice, which is that you can either give full equal rights or you can give the Palestinians a state. And they've said, well, we would like option three which is permanent occupation and apartheid. Uh, and I, I just don't think that's sustainable in the, in the long term, right? Because you have to, you're not a democratic state. And so you're going to, it's going to be very difficult to ever be a democratic state as long as you're insisting on maintaining a condition where a large number of people are excluded from participation in governance. And so what do you think that the United States relationship should be with Israel at this point, knowing that, you know, we, we don't exactly have the cleanest record in supporting authoritative and apartheid regimes across the world at any point in history? My, my position on this has always been very simple. And it's the same. It's a, United States should have the same position towards Israel that we should have towards uh, Saudi Arabia, which is we don't give you weapons unless you respect the basic human rights of your people. So we still give, you know, a colossal amount, billions of dollars in military aid to Israel every year. Don't do it. Don't give them a penny until there is a satisfactory resolution to the conflict that re reflects the basic national aspirations and rights of the Palestinian people. Uh, it, it, the US, U.S. policy, you know, this is often portrayed as a very complicated issue. It's not much of a complicated issue at all. Uh, it's pretty easy to see what... It, I mean, it would be more difficult if the United States didn't uh, offer... didn't give Israel so much aid, because then the question will be, well, what, lev what levers do we, do we pull? Um, but we actually have a giant lever, which is that we hand them a stack of... You know, we hand them a giant suitcase of money every year. Don't give them hmm. the suitcase of money. <laughs> you know, what's interesting about that is I, I feel like it's at this point more symbolic than anything else because it, the, the aid, I think, equates to something in the order of about $4 billion a year, which, it, yeah. which to be perfectly frank, is a rounding error when we're talking about, you know, geopolitical aid to anybody at this point. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, I mean, maybe maybe that would have a demonstrable effect um, in Haiti if we actually had a, a, a humanistic approach to managing affairs there or assisting them in managing affairs. But so I do see it as largely symbolic at this point. But I think you touched on something else, which is um, uh, it's not just that, but it's also our uh, whether it's it, it basically the U.S. clearing the deck to allow our military industrial complex to profit with conflicts abroad and, and basically arming the entire globe to the teeth. And so we're seeing that play out right now in Ukraine. And, um, you know, we didn't talk about this prior, but. I find the Ukraine discussion fascinating in the United States. Just just to talk about and and, and again, not taking a moral uh, position on on something that is definitively not our issue, but how it's being interpreted domestically, I find really fascinating because you find the far left in some cases aligning with the far right. In some cases, that's sort of a reflection of, I think, of what we felt with the anti-vax movement that, you know, coming out of COVID. Mm -hmm. This very strange, um, th this very strange marriage, very strange bedfellows of certain key issues on the very far right and what we would consider the far left in this country coming together almost to me like in, in the human form of RFK Jr. at this point. Mm -hmm. What do you think that portends for the future of of the established parties and and is there like is there a do you see maybe another movement coming out of this era that is just totally a factual totally a historical sort of i i mean almost radicalized through through fiction and prevailing fiction that that we find in, in this new media landscape um that really starts to challenge some of the authority of the established parties? 
Yeah, I, I, it actually scares me a little bit when I see uh, RFK's... You know, he's not doing well in the in the polls because he's kind of running in the wrong primary. He's saying a lot of things that people who are the Democratic base don't like, uh, and, not, and not many things that they do like. But again, you learn a lot about the world if you look at the comments on YouTube videos, okay? So you watch <laughs> RFK videos, which I do. Millions of views on some of these things. Thousands mm -hmm. and thousands of people saying, like, similar stuff to what I said with Peterson. This man is a truth teller. Everyone is trying to shut him down and censor him because he's the one man who's willing to tell it like it is and stick it to both party establishments, right? And for me, you know, he seems he seems like a real kook. Um, but those are real people. They're not. I, I do not actually think those are bots. I do not think uh, those are AI generated uh, oh, yeah, comments by the uh, RFK yeah. campaign. I think a lot of people watch him, and he feeds that that kind of hunger for mm -hmm. an anti-establishment candidate, which is why, to me, it's actually quite a shame that we don't have someone like Bernie in this primary because Bernie fed that same hunger. And what was nice was having a candidate who could appeal to that kind of vague, unformed, anti-establishment feeling where you sense that you're being screwed, but you're not quite sure how and so, yeah. you know, you're willing to believe a lot of stuff. There's nothing that the, if someone tells you that the establishment did something, whether it's, you know, you know, buried the bodies of aliens at Area 51 or whether it's like, uh, you know, lie about vaccines, you're willing to believe it because you wouldn't put anything past them. So what, but what Bernie did that was nice was to take those people and say, look, Let's focus on the real world problems that, that you face. And he kind of took that feeling and gave it this refreshing sanity. And if you don't have someone who's really on message and really willing to say, okay, yes, I agree with you about the establishment. That's why we need to protect Social Security and Medicare. And that's why we need Medicare for all. And we need to deal with the climate crisis. Um, there's like but, so Nathan, kind of, let me ask yeah. you though, sure. if Marianne Williamson is reflecting a lot of those same values, and in the yeah. very beginning it looked like maybe, maybe, maybe. she might find some traction. Uh, yeah. I don't think that she's going to have the money or the wherewithal. She's certainly yeah. going to be shut down by the establishment media and not get a foothold. Yeah. I have my own feelings on on her candidacy and and why uh, I believe her to be a, a charlatan, and I think people are kind of seeing that. Uh, and she doesn't have the the sex appeal of the last name of an RFK Jr. or the yeah. these very you know these very personal issues that people are attaching to like the like the vaccinations in Ukraine and and any some of the more conspiratorial elements. So I I can kind of intellectualize RFK Jr. more so than a Marianne Williamson, but she is reflecting a lot of the narrative that Bernie yeah. Sanders ran on and popularized. Why do you think she's not finding as much traction on the left? I don't know, uh, probably for the reasons that you hinted at there, which is I think a lot of people have similar views of her. She doesn't exactly have a track record of, you know, Bernie Sanders had spent his entire career fighting for working people, saying the same things, um, working in Congress behind the scenes to move legislation as much as he could. He'd fought Barack Obama on protecting Social Security. And one of the things people liked about him was that they understood that he wasn't a phony. He had that real sense of deep authenticity where you knew what you were getting. And, mm -hmm. you know, Marion Williamson has the same platform, the same agenda. I've read her book, A Politics of Love, and it's uh, very uplifting and she's very progressive. You did? I did. Um, it's You're not a good bad, person. Actually. It's not bad. No, it's really not okay. bad. She's, I mean, you know, she's she's a skilled writer. That's how she sells millions of books. But she is from a world, the the world of um, inspirational literature that is uh, rife with people we might describe as phonies or charlatans. And I don't think she does convincingly get across the message that it's not opportunistic and a response to the shifting political winds. Um, Bernie Sanders does not shift in response to political winds, right? He, he Bernie mm -hmm. Sanders in 1980 was the same as Bernie Sanders in 2016. Marion Williamson, you know, if you go back to her in the 80s and 90s, she's not really that political 
you know, just, just sort of spiritual. You know, she had this. I, I interviewed her and I asked her about this uh, news story about her treatment of her staff, which you know they alleged a lot of you know anger and abuse behind the scenes. I don't know if it's true, but I do know that you have to be able to convince people that you are the real deal, that you mean what you say, and that you're not just responding to the fact that you see a lane for progressivism. Yeah, and I, I felt like a lot of the criticism about her, you know, how she might have behaved behind the scenes had a tinge of misogyny to it because that's mm -hmm. not the – those, that's not the line of questioning that's usually explored when you talk about any any male candidate. Like I don't I don't know if we know what Cornell West is like in his personal life or RFK Jr. I don't think we've ever kind of explored those issues. Just like I, I always laugh when um, I see mothers, new mothers interviewed uh, that are famous, and uh, the questions usually tend to be like, "Well, how do you manage uh, you know becoming a new mother?" Uh, with your career and all those kind of things, but those questions are never asked of new fathers, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, I feel like we know maybe too much about Marianne Williamson behind the scenes, and that's sort of sullied the characterization of how she might be as a candidate. But at the same time, I find her extremely problematic in in her belief systems um, because it does lend it does lend itself more to this sort of like faux so self help the secret type of you know philosophy if you ask the universe it shall it shall deliver to you uh kind of thing and that that's just not going to work uh in practical politics and, and what have you but she does stand and and so this is something i, I if i can get personal with you for a second mm. about your your place in the world because i i do find you to be a, somewhat of a curiosity um mary ann williamson is a is a guru, is a spiritual guide, is in, to some people seen as a public intellectual. Cornell West is absolutely has been a public intellectual his entire life and now leaning into the, the political realm. Um, I feel as though you occupy kind of a, a, a space in, in American culture that hasn't been occupied for quite some time, maybe since Christopher Hitchens before he sort of became, uh, you know, I don't want to say went off the rails, but, you know, but became a little more agitated and, and more um, a more warmonger. about became a warmonger, <laughs> a little bit of a warmonger. But he came more about the media appeal than he became about the his stance as sure. a public intellectual. Whereas I see you and I characterized you again as in the introduction as our generation's answer to Gore Vidal, because you have this unique ability to engage in polemics without offending anybody. To say so, oh, I don't know. You should see my the email inbox. <laughs> so when I say, so you do it with kindness. You can be scathing, but you're not yeah. mean spirited. Yeah. So, um, like in, in in you've had a, a few dialogues now that I've I watched in with with great interest with Glenn Greenwald as an example, mm. and the two of you keep it pretty high brow. I mean, you've engaged with Katie Halper, with Matt Taibbi. You've engaged with so many of the of the what, again, some would consider public intellectuals. I don't necessarily agree with that. But you're sort of kind of rising and emerging out of this as, as, as a different character. Um, how do you f what what is it that you're striving to if you if you could reflect back how you wish to be viewed in, in by the public and how you want to impact the the, the discourse, how yeah. do you see yourself? I know it's a difficult question, yeah. but how, how do you feel about that characterization? I, I don't. Well, I'm grateful for the characterization. Very complimentary. Uh, I uh, I don't really want to be viewed by by the public. To be honest, I've fa fallen into this position, but my aim is always the 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 ideas the you know the rather i i, I really it's unfortunate because i go like i am kind of a, a personality i'm like a very conspicuous person it's like a, i don't know i just have like i don't know an, like an unsubtle character like i fill a, a room or whatever but i don't really like being the 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 thing that is discussed i'm trying to use current affairs to advance a set of ideas and to get people thinking about the things that i think need to be thought about so i approach the work with a sense of okay what how do we use whatever platform i have and the people and whatever platform current affairs has 
to try and not mold and manipulate, but to try and nudge human thought and discussion in the directions we want it to go. So how do we get people to think more critically about people like Jordan Peterson, for instance? How do we have an intelligent discussion about the things that we've been talking about, um, like US foreign policy or like the role of third parties? Um, how do we get away from the cycle of hot takes and just and just start thinking mm. and you know <laughs> so that's that's you know my my goal to the extent that I am a public intellectual is to try and make you know from a left perspective um, to try and move public conversation about important issues in a way in a direction that I think is more thoughtful and sane. <laughs> Okay, so if you could take – maybe it's an issue of current affairs. It could be a single article. Maybe it's one of the books that you've written. If you could take one thing and, and, and make sure that everybody in the world has read it, has consumed it, has ingested it, really understands it, is there a piece that you're most proud of that, that really represents like, you know, I really want you to, if you could grab hold of, of the, the, the public zeitgeist and say, please, please, I stand by this information and I'm really proud of it. What, yeah. Is there a piece of work you've done that you would uh, put out there? I have, there's a lot of different, obviously, like my kind of encapsulation of my political views is in why you should be a socialist. That's the most kind of comprehensive uh, single work that is, an, that is an overview. So you get a lot of the sides of me in, in that. Um, I was thinking about, and then, and then there's, you know, I just did a book that's a speculation on the utopian future, and that kind of encapsulates my view of the human future. I'd like everyone to read that too. But I want to mention one piece here because uh, I'm so proud of it, and nobody ever reads it. Uh, <laughs> it's got nothing. It got nothing. No one read it. It's called the uh, the Great American World War II story, and it is about World War II, uh, but it is specifically about a place here in New Orleans, the National World War II Museum, which happens to be about three blocks from where I work. And I went there, and it's $400 million they spent building this museum. It's one of the best museums oh. I've ever seen. It's also a, a work of just pure propaganda. And the reason why I'm so proud of this piece is because I I don't go out of the office much to write my pieces. I don't do much actual reporting in the field. And this one I only went, went three blocks away. But I was so fascinated by this museum because the whole thing is about, you know, how does America tell its story? How do we see ourselves and how do we convince ourselves that we are always the good guys and how do we <laughs> eliminate all of the complexity from the world. And the World War II Museum is actually a fascinating place to study as you think about national myth making. And so my piece is actually not just about World War II, but it's about war generally and the threat of potential global catastrophic war in our own century, which is probably the issue that I am more concerned about than anything else. And the core argument of the piece is until we understand the way in which we are capable of telling stories in which we can do no wrong, we are going to be at great risk of telling ourselves another one of those stories that is going to contribute to a catastrophic global conflict. Um, and, you know, obviously I think of the way that we approach China and Russia in ways that in a nuclear era uh, could lead to a civilization ending catastrophe. And I'm very proud of that piece because I think that piece is my, my strongest statement on one of the issues that I care most about, which is, you know, the need to figure out how we can have a lasting peace in a heavily armed world. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, I've been following a lot of the work of uh, Jeffrey Sachs for, for many, many years, mm. and he's come out so strongly of late um, against the saber rat rattling and the behind the scenes maneuvers and machinations to pit ourselves in this it, it, to kind of like gin up a new Cold War with uh, with China. But also mm -hmm. the backdrop of that, again, being climate change and the fact that 
new areas of exploration, but also weakness are emerging in the Arctic where they had previously never been. And so there's all of these dynamics at play with global warming in the background, sort of a changing of the guard. We'd actually done a piece a little while ago about um, the, the effect of climate change and how the military industrial complex has been viewing it since the early 90s because there was reporting out of the Pentagon that mo- has – the Pentagon has been modeling climate change since the 90s in, conti- in a continuous study. And one of the suppositions of their research is that – there's not much we're going to do, and they've been deadly accurate because they have access to the best scientists in the world in terms of what would transpire and when. And so far, they've been absolutely accurate. And one of their theories is that the United States, because of our geography, because of our topography, the diversity and the abundance that we have here will fare better through the ravages of climate change than most the rest of the world, certainly uh, the the southern hemisphere, but also China. So a lot of China is actually in lowlands that are that is very very open to um, to the rising of the seas, to temperatures, and to the changing that's going to that's going to impact their ability to uh, to be productive in terms of agriculture. And so China has a vest- China has access to this information too. They have a vested interest in now expanding their footprint around the world. And I see that this Cold War is less about militarization. It's less about economic productivity because we are. We are absolutely attached at the hip when it comes to China. Our economy does not work without them, and no one's economy works without us. So the the pretense for war is not going to be driven by the economy. I think it's going to be driven by land. It's going to be driven by access to productive land and what remains uh, through the through the this cyclical changes. So uh, anyway, a, a long way of saying that I'm absolutely going to read that piece. I would like everybody else to read your piece as well. Because mythologizing and is, is how we get ourselves into – it's how every empire has gotten itself into conflagrations throughout history. Uh, so we're, that's not unique to us. But we do have our own particular brand that appears to be uh, undetectable in the American public. We seem to be very uh, kind of eyes wide open and gullible and willing to consume whatever is fed to us through, through the state uh, apparatus. So I'm curious to see that piece Um, Nathan, as you think about the kind of the next couple of years um, and you look out over rapid, rapid changes across the globe. And again, we've talked about we've covered a lot of ground today and talking about different issues. Um, What's the one thing that's on your radar in the immediate that is occupying your brain space that you haven't quite wrapped your mind around, but you can't wait to unravel? What are you working on? Oh, what am I? Hmm. Hmm. Uh, let's see. I mean, other than the things we've, I, I mean, the fact is that I'm working on a big book on uh, uh, foreign policy at the moment. So I, well, this the World War Two thing is the the main issue right now to me is trying to think about the future of war and peace. I'm also though. Uh, very interested in might I, I I was actually just thinking today that I might eventually have to do a book on AI because I mm. want to you know writing a book is the way that you learn about something so you you yep. you start the project and then you do all the research to try and put your thoughts together and organize your thoughts and I have become very convinced that it is going to cause. I, I accept that it is going to cause a cataclysm of some unknown kind. I don't, I'm very skeptical of the AI doomers who think the super intelligence is going to come and, and kill us all. I think they are wrong. Um, and But I don't know what the problems it's going to cause are. So, for example, uh, there was just an op-ed in the New York Times by the head of Palantir, Peter Thiel's Palantir, saying we have to accelerate AI weapons, because if we don't, China will. And, you know, that scares the hell out of me when I hear we have to accelerate an arms race and AI weapons that just sound, sounds like a disaster. But I want to understand better, you know, what mm. AI weapons could be like, what they could do, how, what decisions could be made that could lead to catastrophe and how. Uh, so I really want to get a better grasp 
on how I don't even know if the the term artificial intelligence is is accurate or useful, but the generative technologies that have been accelerating in the last couple of years, as I have played with them and experimented with them, have just blown my mind and defied all my expectations of what a computer could do. And I know that they that they we have not yet hit the point at which they are going to make their their massive social impact. Um, so I want to better understand, as someone who writes about you know the future of society and wants to nudge society in the right direction, how that factors into the calculus because it wasn't something that I was thinking about you know two years or even a year ago. That's that's great. That's going to save me a lot of time. I'm just going to let you come up with the answer instead of looking into it because it's very, very hard to wrap one's head around. We, our audience is very familiar with Peter Thiel, by the way. We've done uh, oh, yeah. we've done a couple of episodes on him. Uh, if ever there was a cartoonish bad guy that was he's concocted sinister. in a lab, he's, he's kind of it. Um, but Nathan, I am such a fan of your work and uh, my – my colleagues always try to warn me against uh, any sort of hero worship, but I have to say that your your writing absolutely breaks me in half. I think you are wow. a, just a tremendous, tremendous writer. I think we're lucky to have you in the public discourse, and uh, I'm certainly rooting for you to uh, to continue to grow. I'm okay losing you to the general public when they when they find you and fall in love with you, and you know <laughs> be, you become a household okay. name. I'm a, I'll, I'm willing to give up on you there. Let's I'm see. very Thankful to Jordan Peterson that he opened the door for me to be able to find you. Uh, and I know that the UNFTR audience, uh, you know, because we actually quoted – we've quoted you a number of times and in particular using Super Predator to build our series on, ah, on yes. the Clinton years, uh, which I believe is your first book. Is that right? That uh, – other, yeah, other than some of the children's books. That was my first first real book. Uh, yeah, it was it was great, and it was it was really eye opening. Very well anger. done. My best writing is done yeah. in anger. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that always the case? Um, He's disappeared. For, we haven't heard from Bill Clinton since then. <laughs> for uh, our audience's edification, uh, we've got Current Affairs. Just in terms of um, interacting with you, we've got Current Affairs magazine, which I encourage people to subscribe to. The physical edition, by the way is really a work of art. Every single one of yeah. them is a work of art. The, the love with which it's put together is apparent in on every page. So I would encourage people to do that. Uh, but for those that are, are not in the market for uh, a little piece of yesterday with a physical magazine being delivered to them and hanging on the coffee table, uh, what are the best ways to interact with your content? Yeah, they can read the Current Affairs online articles at currentaffairs.org. We post, we don't have a paywall. We post all of the articles online eventually. So there's some fun stuff in the magazine you won't get if you don't get the print edition. But you can also get it digitally as a PDF. Uh, so currentaffairs.org has all the articles. Uh, you can listen to, uh, we have a Current Affairs podcast, uh, which is at uh, patreon.com slash currentaffairs. And uh, we have our Current Affairs News Briefing, which is a twice-weekly, uh, this is paid, a paid newsletter updating people on the things that are going on that actually matter, and that is at currentaffairs.substack.com, and we are at C-U-R Affairs on Twitter, and I think I'm at Nathan J. Robinson, sometimes I have opinions on Twitter as well. Boy, I hate to correct the writer here, but it's not Twitter anymore. R.I.P. Oh, Twitter. sorry. I on I mean on X. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, what a what a disaster. That's for another day. Uh, I hope we can do this again. I hope uh, we. This is the I beginning so. of a long conversation. Yes. Well, we at Current Affairs for... love love the podcast too. Uh, it's so so well done. So I was uh, delighted. You know, it was I. It was me who reached out to you. Uh, because, That's right. Uh, the, because we like we like what you do. So it's great to connect. I appreciate that. Nathan, thank you for your time today. And uh, hopefully Thanks. we'll catch you soon. Thanks, when, when something rages in the world and we can't figure it out, we'll just come to you for the answer. <laughs> Matter of time. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much, Nathan. Mmm. Delicious. Hey, everybody. It's Max. Let me ask you something. Do you like coffee? I love coffee. I drink a lot of coffee. I drink so much coffee that I'm actually 99% coffee at this point. Maybe that's why I haven't slept since the 1990s. Do you know what else happened in the 1990s? 
My friends on the Puspatuck Reservation founded a coffee company called Native Coffee Traders, and we partnered up with Native Coffee Traders to produce our own line of coffee that helps support not only our show, but indigenous entrepreneurship on the Puspatuck Reservation. So here's what we were able to produce together and why I think you should buy only our coffee and double your intake of caffeine. It all started with a simple but powerful premise. Un your morning. That's right. Our entire coffee line started with this bag of beans, grown in Nicaragua, shipped directly to the Puspatuck Reservation, and roasted with love. But because we think that coffee should be consumed every minute of every day, we then launched Un your afternoon. That inevitably led to a discussion among our listeners, some of whom said, hey, Max, I too love coffee, but, you know, for the aroma and the taste, and I don't want to be up all day and all night like you. So we launched a decaffeinated un and that led to a discussion between our over-caffeinated audience who said, I love on your morning and I love on your afternoon, but sometimes, boy, it'd be nice to have something right in the middle. You have anything a little more mellow? And I said, surely, surely I do. Don't call me Shirley. How about Mellow Maynard, affectionately named for John Maynard Keynes? And that's it. So if you want to get sufficiently jacked up to take on the day, or if, like me, you hit 3 o'clock and every day you just feel the urge to <clears throat> go to UNFTR.com to find out how to purchase our line of native roasted coffee. Help us, help them, help yourself. Here ended the commercial. <laughs> Anyhow, oh, because I love coffee. Un your morning. That's right. We launched this how to un. If you tapped into my veins, you would find only coffee.